Hello, History 362. So today I'm going to talk about another Seleucid institution, the Seleucid Royal Army. Um, and this institution is important for, I, I think, two reasons. One, military force, military power, is the uh, sine qua non of the abilities of Seleucid king to rule their empire. Once they are unable to control space militarily through coercive force, they cease to rule. Um, uh, uh, they cease to rule it. Um, so without the Seleucid army, there would be no Seleucid kingdom. Um, and indeed, um, uh, military, military competency, military abilities are at the core, are a central component of royal ideology. This is actually true for all the Hellenistic kingdoms, but particularly the Seleucids. Um, Seleucid kings uh, portray themselves as effective warrior kings. Um, uh, and indeed, their claim to rule Asia is, uh, it rests on no legitimacy, it rests on, the, on conquest. They claim to rule it as spear one land, architectos gay. Um, and uh, so therefore, um, uh, uh, the Seleucid army is important as, simply as a key pillar of Seleucid power and control. Um, now the Seleucid army, the examining the Seleucid army is also key to the theme uh, that I laid out uh, at the start of this course, I mean, the theme of Greeks and non-Greeks and how they interact. Um, uh, because the Seleucid army is going to contain a core of Greco-Macedonian settlers, um, but it's also going to involve numerous contingents of native levies. Um, and therefore, these native levies participate in the Seleucid royal project and are paid and at times rewarded for that participation. Um, they also, though, um, are uh, in some ways uh, agents of their own subjugation, um, uh, given that uh, they can they support the institution that makes the Seleucid control possible. Um, so the core, however, of the Seleucid army are military settlers, uh, and this this goes back to the the importance of city foundations as uh, as a as a key component of Seleucid power. Um, uh, Seleucid early, starting with Seleucus I Nicator, and this only continues, um, when cities are founded, discharged veterans are given land, uh, a, 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 a kleros is a plot of land, um, and that plot of land has military obligations. Once you've got a kleros, you and your descendants now owe the king military service. Um, and uh, cities will maintain their muster rolls. Again, there's a lot of communities that are not poles, but are uh, called katokii. Um, uh, uh, set, I mean, settlements might be simply the best term. They're not big enough to be poles, but they still consist of people who have been given plots of land and now have to serve as soldiers. Um, now, the citizen, is there, I guess the, the settler component, um, uh, is not a full-time professional army. So, uh, most of the time, these guys are on their plots, um, and then when the king mobilizes them, um, they either come off the plot or have to send at least one male representative from the plot, um, uh, and that serves in the Macedonian army. Um, and then when the war campaign is over, uh, in some instances they're even discharged during the winter, um, uh, they go home back to their plot and they can continue to support themselves. So this has obviously some advantages, a kind of part-time uh, militia system. Firstly, the king doesn't have to pay a, a, as large a standing army. These guys go back to their farms. They're already supported for it. They've got a nice big estate um, in their kleros to feed them when they're not actively serving the king. He doesn't necessarily have to keep them in a, in a barracks. Um, secondly, um, uh, since many of these places are with, with both, both poles and uh, uh, katoikii um, are out in the uh, places that Seleucid, you know, uh, in regions that the Seleucid kings need to control, these settler communities double as garrisons. Um, those settlers are still there. They still have weapons. Um, uh, military units are organized according to these communities. Um, and so uh, these, uh, these kind of uh, colonies uh, um, therefore provide a garrison function simply keeping the locals down because there's now a bunch of heavily armed Greco-Macedonian settlers who may simply be watching out for themselves, but in the process help to control the territory for the king. Um, and we know that some of these uh, uh, have uh, you know, organized uh, watches around the walls, presumably people coming off their kleros to sort of be part of the kind of city guard when they're not serving with the king's army. Um, now, the uh, 
these settler units fight um, as uh, Macedonian style infantry and cavalry. Indeed, they're oftentimes referred to as Macedonians. Here we have to actually realize that ethnic category is at this point probably a flexible one. Um, yes, some of these clerics or katoikoi um, are probably the descendants of Alexander the Great's soldiers. That's quite likely. They, are, they have a lot of Macedonian blood in their veins. Um, but in many ways, probably by the time we get to the end of the third century, Macedonian in a Seleucid context is a bit of a kind of fictive ethnic category. There's a lot of people who are by descent, you know, Thracian or, or Cretan or, or from other parts of the Aegean or Greek um, or Carian, who, because they, they managed to get a plot, maybe because they were a discharged mercenary soldier, um, uh, they now start styling themselves as Macedonian. And when they fight with their units, they fight in Macedonian fashion. Um, so they fight in a big pike phalanx, just really not dissimilar to the phalanxes that were deployed by um, Alexander the Great. Um, uh, so the, Seleuc the, the sort of infantry component will consist of a main phalanx um, uh, that uh, is as large as 20,000 uh, men. Um, there also is a special unit, and this is actually common across the Hellenistic kingdoms, of there being a, a special unit. The, for the Seleucids, this special unit are called the Silver Shields, the Argulaspides. Um, and the Silver Shields uh, are 10,000 strong. This may simply be a coincidence, but 10,000 is the strength of the standing Achaemenid crack infantry unit, the Immortals. Um, but the Silver Shields are 10,000 strong. Um, uh, they, we don't know exactly who staffs them, but they may be staffed by the wealthier clerics. Um, we know it from Macedonia um, that the sort of special unit in Macedonia, the Peltasts, are staffed by men who come from wealthier families. Um, uh, and nonetheless, they, they are seen as kind of a crack unit. Um, they also fight as phalangites, um, but uh, they fight on the right-hand uh, side of the formation, the place of honor, um, and maybe of somewhat higher quality um, than the just sort of regular kind of militia heavy phalanx. So we have the, the main Seleucid phalanx, again, pikemen fighting probably 16 to 32 men deep, a dense, packed phalanx. We have the Silver Shields who, who use similar tactics, um, but are seen as somewhat more elite, and, and it's a somewhat more prestigious unit to be in, the Argo Aspides. Um, and then we know that we have uh, various units of Mas Macedonian-style heavy cavalry, um, uh, uh, who, uh, uh, who are also recruited um, according to civic cavalry contingents. Um, so that's the core of the Seleucid army. And, and uh, again, if for a big Seleucid field army, that core can, can easily represent um, uh, 25 to 30,000 um, men. Um, but it's not all of the Seleucid army. So the Seleucids are, are, again, unique in that they heavily recruit from native regions um, uh, and particular places that have uh, kind of their own unique um, martial specialty. So they recruit, um, uh, for example, slingers uh, from uh, 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 Iran, slingers and archers. Um, Cavalry-wise, these Seleucids are responsible for introducing a very important uh, concept into eventually European cavalry, and that, that is the concept of a cataphract. Um, uh, cataphracts are heavily armored cavalry, where not only does the rider wear armor, but so does the horse. And, and this heavy armor oftentimes includes uh, armory and going down the sleeves. The horse has a front piece uh, and oftentimes a kind of uh, the horse equivalent of a breastplate, um, a face masks. Um, the idea of very heavily armored cavalry uh, seems to actually come either from the Iranian plateau, it's, it's either an Iranian innovation, or it may come from uh, a, a steep nomads, a set nomads of uh, Central Asia, and, it, and the Seleucids pick it up. Um, and uh, by the end of the third century, the Seleucids are fielding large contingents of their own cataphract heavy cavalry. So this is actually an example of a military innovation that comes from outside of the Greek world, during the Hellenistic period. Um, and then particularly given the multi-ethnic nature of the Seleucids and the multi-ethnic nature of the Seleucid army, um, subsequently uh, gets incorporated uh, and becomes a mainstay of Seleucid heavy cavalry. 
presumably no uh, a number of citizen uh, heavy cavalry units are uh, arming themselves as cataphracts, cataphractoi. Um, so that's actually one implication. Um, but nonetheless, there are there are many many native contingents uh, 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 in the Seleucid army, um, uh, and and again this is this is uh, different from other Hellenistic kings that don't make as heavily uh, use of non Greek um, native forces. Um, so the, on one hand, this is a, this is actually an advantage of the Seleucids. They get a lot of different sort of specialty troops. These people are really good at being archers. These people are really good at being slingers. Um, uh, uh, and uh, that, uh, that, that kind of flushes out the capacities of the Seleucid army. Um, now the Seleucids also, like all Hellenistic forces, employ mercenaries. And indeed the Hellenistic period is oftentimes portrayed as the kind of golden age of the mercenary, just people who have you know, uh, no, no uh, patriotism and simply sell themselves their sword to the highest bidder. Um, it is true, when we have roll-ups of Hellenistic armies, including Seleucid armies, they're usually described as being about 25% mercenary. Most of these mercenaries are recruited from the Aegean. Uh, so, for example, Cretan mercenaries are very desirable. Cretans, in part, are also really good archers. And, you know, archery is hard, you know. Just can't go to Boy Scout camp for a couple seasons and come out a crack archer, as I learned, unfortunately. Um, but on Crete, people practice all their lives to be really good archers. And so you can you can simply buy that expertise. Um, same with slingers. Um, uh, uh, now, a, another people who are really uh, important mercenaries or a key source of mercenary recruitment are the Galatians. So all of those Gauls who crossed into to Asia um, after the invasion of Greece in 279. They go into Asia. They're defeated by... Antiochus I in the elephant battle, which becomes a kind of creedal moment in Seleucid ideology. Why do, why do the Seleucids have the right to rule Asia? Oh, we beat the Gauls. We, we, drove, we defeated the Gauls when they invaded Asia. And now that is a key cornerstone of our right to rule. Um, that being said, Antiochus doesn't quite defeat the Gauls. He, they settle in, what's, in what becomes known as Galatia and central Anatolia. Um, and... They are a key source. Everyone, while they want to talk about how terrible the Gauls are and how proud they are we beat them, the Gauls are a key source of military manpower. They, you hire as many of them as you can as mercenaries. Um, they fight as uh, kind of heavy infantry. They fight as, as, as cavalry. Um, and you use them to plus up your military manpower whenever you can. Um, now, one thing about military service in the Seleucid army. Um, again, we tend to think of mercenaries against simply selfish people who have no country and are only in it for themselves. For a lot of these mercenaries, um, A, mercenary service in some ways it has elements of an alliance. So when the, for the Seleucids to recruit mercenary troops, they're not, they're not just going out on a kind of grand open market and randomly recruiting soldiers of fortune. Um, rather, their ability to recruit mercenaries typically involves maintaining diplomatic relationships with particular communities who are allies of the Seleucids. And as part of that, that uh, dip, you know, good diplomatic relations, um, so the Seleucids gain the ability to recruit mercenary soldiers from that particular community. So in some ways, when you see mercenaries being recruited by the Seleucids, it's actually a sign that they have connections and a relationship of peace and friendship and cooperation that, among other things, allows the citizens of those communities to come over into the Seleucid army and serve as mercenaries. So again, mercenaries are in some ways kind of allies, or there's an element of an alliance behind a lot of mercenary service. Um, also, there is simply elements of immigration. That is, mercenaries are not usually Soldiers of fortune who will happily trade masters. Sometimes, sometimes they are. It happens. But um, more frequently, it seems that mercenary soldiers are actually people who are interested in becoming Seleucid. That they aren't simply serving to say, hey, I'm going to go fight for Antiochus for like two months and then fight for Ptolemy for two months if he pays more and then fight for it. I mean, instead, oftentimes mercenaries will serve for an extended period of time. And many mercenaries, the goal of many mercenaries is to obtain a kleros and 
upon being rewarded with the Kleros, kind of become a settler, become one of those Greco-Macedonians who now fights as a, as a, as a Greco-Macedonian soldier. And of course, in a few instances, we do know of contingents of the Seleucid army who are described as uh, with kind of mercenary uh, ethnonyms, like Thracians, um, but they live in Persia and they come from Persia and they're part of a bigger brigade of Persians. And it seems these are a, a mercenary brigade that was settled off in the uh, in a region that the Seleucids wanted to control, in this case, Persia, um, and then uh, subsequently continued to kind of serve as an ethnic unit, perhaps here retaining some of their ethnic um, uh, weapons and, and tactics and fighting styles. Um, so again, while the Seleucids, you know, again, 20 to 25% of the Seleucid army is mercenaries, but a lot of those mercenaries are actually using this as an immigration strategy. Um, and this mercenary service is a way that they kind of become Seleucid. Um, uh, and it, it's possible that their descendants will be the people that will be fighting in the main phalanx, the, the Greco-Macedonian phalanx. Again, the, the sources we call a Macedonian phalanx, full of Macedonians. Um, but again, those guys, in many instances, may be the sons and grandsons of, of uh, settled mercenary soldiers. Um, now, uh, one other key technology that the Seleucids are uh, uh, strongly associated with is the war elephant. Um, now, Alexander the Great had discovered uh, uh, war elephants when he crosses over the Hindu Kush into India and had, had acquired the first sort of war elephants, although it does not seem that he used them in battle in any meaningful way. Um, and so it's during the wars of the successors that the war elephant actually becomes a, uh, a military technology that Hellenistic kings are able to use. And Seleucus I had famously been a pioneer in the effective use of war elephants. That's in part because, remember, he'd gone over uh, and, and uh, crossed over the Hindu Kush, engaged in a diplomatic negotiation with Shandagupta, received supposedly 500 war elephants in exchange for leaving and never coming back. Um, and then he takes those elephants, and those are elephants that he subsequently uses um, to, uh, uh, they're actually quite decisive, supposedly, in the Battle of Ipsus. Um, so the Seleucids, of all the, everyone who's using war elephants, the Seleucids, uh, A, use them, seem to use them the best. Um, they also have the best war elephants. Um, uh, the best war elephants come from India. Um, the, in Africa, uh, the, the sort of big African uh, elephant of this, of this uh, sub-Saharan Africa um, is not used for war elephants. It's probably, uh, it's probably too big and wild anyway. There is a now extinct bush elephant in northern Africa that is used as a war elephant, but it's actually much smaller than the Indian elephant and is considered inferior. So the ancient world, the best war elephants come from India, and the Seleucids continue to have the connection to India. Um, so they can, they can actually, through probably trade, obtain new war elephants. They likely are also obtaining the, uh, the Mahouts uh, that, that uh, staff that, that actually ride the elephant. Um, many of these may actually be Indian mercenaries who uh, you know, make a long journey in order to, to pr prove uh, you know, sort of specialist elephant riders. Um, uh, and it's also possible that the Seleucids also trade some elephants. Um, uh, supposedly, um, uh, Hannibal's favorite elephant is Surus. Um, Surus likely means the Syrian elephant and, and is, re is referencing for an elephant that probably has come by, uh, perhaps either the elephant itself or its genetic you know, sort of stud line has come from India to Seleucid Syria and then uh, has been purchased for the, the Carthaginian war herd. Um, so war elephants are an asset that, that are strongly associated with the Seleucids. Uh, they are the elephant kings. Um, and indeed, the elephant is an, is an important symbol of Seleucid ideology, as well as being a weapon of war. Um, so uh, that's just an overview of the Seleucid army. Um, later this week, we'll talk a little bit of the, of the Seleucid army in, uh, in battle. But to suffice to say, it's a big army. The, the largest attested Seleucid field army is 72,000 uh, men. Um, uh, and uh, the Seleucids raise similar armies on a few other occasions. So the Seleucids are capable of substantial manpower mobilization. Um, 
And as you can see, it's a, one reason for that size, one reason the Seleucids can raise such big armies is the fact that they are willing to uh, mobilize the multi-ethnic manpower of their region, not just the core of, uh, of settlers, of, of katoikoi, of, of, of clerics, um, but of, because uh, that, that gets you again, that might get you to 30,000 or so, but also uh, native contingents and outside mercenaries, many of whom will actually sort of, uh, uh, this, is, this is their way of immigration. Um, so let's leave it for there. Um, next time we're actually going to talk about a kind of whirlwind tour of Seleucid uh, uh, high political and military history. Um, one or maybe two videos. Um, so I'll see you soon.